wants to walk or bike or skate so along the road, we do aerobics and we do tai chi and we do cha cha cha. Whatever you want, and everything is about physical activity. And it's magical. Who comes? Everybody. All you need is two feet and a heartbeat, and you're going to be there. Young, old, rich, poor, fat, skinny. Everybody. We get over 1.7 million people every Sunday and holiday, 65 days of the year. And the nice thing is that it changes their minds. All of a sudden, people realize oh, the streets are public space. They belong to all of us, they are public. And they can have different uses according to the time of the day, the day of the week, the week of the year. And it works in cities of 10,000 people, or 20,000, or it works in New York. When in New York we're doing it right on Park Avenue, not on an isolated street, Park Avenue, the most iconic. San Jose, California, 55,000 cars on Friday, people biking on Sunday. And it can work in places you know, in the last 15 years, it has taken off to hundreds of cities. Anybody can do it. All of a sudden, we realize that the streets, from the point of view of social integration, we're working in Cape Town and Johannesburg, where it's so needed in, in India. Eight years ago, there was not one in India. Now there's more than 100 programs. Different activities, but everything is physical activity. Maybe they are playing more badminton, they are not doing other kind of things. But at the end of the day, it's the same. It's that public space, that 30, 40% of our city that belongs to all of us. How to use it? So this is this social integration in Paris. In Paris, they used to have this crazy thing that they call Paris Plage, only one month of the year, from the middle of July to the middle of August. And they said, well, if it works so well, one month, why don't we do it always? It's not about sitting down, it's more about doing physical activity, public spirit. So they said, okay, well, we're going to do it every Sunday, even in the winter time, along the same river. And the beauty of this is that you connect. Everybody has sequels. Sometimes we have the wealthiest people, the owners of the largest corporations and their spouses and children, meeting their minimum wage worker with the spouses and children in the same place. That doesn't happen anywhere else. They don't live in the same buildings. Their kids don't go to the same schools. They don't go to the same restaurants. But here, they meet each other as sequels. When my brother was mayor the first time 15 years ago, now he's mayor again as of last year, he built 280 kilometers of protected byways in three years. This is not expensive, this is not a, a financial issue, it's not a technical issue. It went from a few thousand to more than almost half a million people. Separating cyclists and pedestrians. So this is totally improvable anywhere. It's very important to create a grid. In some of the places where it was built, it's impossible in beautiful Birmingham to even dream what it looks like. This is what it looks like. And this is how really nice protected byway and sidewalk looks like. When I say it's not financial, of course, you gotta have priorities. There was not money for everything. You have to choose either walking and cycling or cars. And he said, no cars, the future administration. Look at this beautiful, he's doing it nice. It's important because it's safer, but also important because we need to dignify the pedestrian. We need to dignify the cyclist. And that's almost as important as anything else different kinds of trees, lights. And it's about being concerned. This morning, when I'm talking about walking, I'm talking about anybody that moves at the speed of the pedestrian, people of wheelchairs. And now he's mayor again, one of the things he's doing, 100 soccer fields all over the city. They are for soccer, they are multi-purpose, for people to do anything, artificial turf. Why artificial turf? Because a soccer field takes up too much space. It's very hard to find space for soccer fields or multi-purpose. So if you put a soccer field and you put natural turf, who uses it? The elite. Two games per day, four days a week, and then it rests in order to have nice grass. <laughs> but if you have artificial turf you can use, and lights, you can use it 24-7. So that's why these hundred fields are going up all over the city. He's in his second year and now more than 30 of those fields are built. But also in leading by example. He bikes regularly to work. Also in the morning there are some mountains and he bikes and people see. There was a huge bull ring in Bogota. And everybody thought of the bulls. Well, bulls were bad, bull ring fights. And instead it became a multi-purpose facility. Colombia played, played the Davis Cup the other day and they, put a, they built a tennis court for that week. For the tennis court. 
And of course, it's also supporting things like the marathon. But he's making sure that the important thing on the marathon is not the 10 guys mostly from Kenya or Ethiopia who win. No, it's the 45,000 that participate. So he's even begging the media, tomorrow morning don't put on the front page this guy from Kenya winning. No, put an aerial photo of 45,000 people participating. He takes all of his cabinet every Saturday on a 12-hour ride to, throughout all of the neighborhoods. They go by every Saturday in different parts of the city. So it, that's part of also changing the mindsets. But enough about both. Throughout, I'm going to be asking, uh, giving opportunities. When you see the blue one, means that if you have any question, any comment, so that we go by areas and then you don't hear me speaking for one hour. Or then more when she's going to say, hey, Gil, it's participatory. Anybody, any comments on what we have seen so far? Yes. Here we got three microphones, so if anybody has a comment, yes. I'm from Berlin, we should work here, right? Yes. Okay. I'm from Berlin, we've got lots of parts. But there's a big issue in the whole, across the whole of the UK now about how parks are funded. And the government is thinking about, and in fact, one city, Bristol, is removing all its public funding from parks. So I'm wondering how you make that pay in Bogota. Well, I'm the chair of World Urban Parks, and I hope all of you see this become members. The parks need to be paid with taxes. Taxes. You know, I love to have the private sector engaged. But we cannot delegate and say, because one of the things that is happening in the world is that where the rich people live, we have magnificent parks. Because that's where the companies want to pay. People said, the other day I was working in Taiwan, and the mayor of the city said, oh, yeah, here we want to do like Central Park. We want to have the private sector pay for it. I said, what, 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 what are you talking about? You are 10,000 miles from Central Park. Central Park is unique. It's the only park in the world that has the wealthiest people living around it. So they take off their hat and they go asking for money and they get $26 million per year. But no other park is going to do it. So we need to be very careful not to have a two-tier park system in the cities that when you got Central Park and Bryan Park and Highline, they're magnificent, and then you go to the places where the low income live. So basically, how to pay? You gotta pay through taxes. It's not, it's not, by the way, I find that in the parks, and I'm going to have a chapter totally on parks, but we, we, it's easier to find the millions to do the parks than to find the thousands to make it work. I don't know. You go to the city and you say, oh, let's do a movie night. We don't have budget. Let's organize a walking group. We don't have budget. Oh, Halloween is coming up. Let's do some more We don't have budget. What? We need to put money into the uses. Any other comment on what we have seen? Okay. Now, I run two organizations, World Urban Parks and 886. And I've been lucky to have worked in more than 250 cities of all sizes in all continents. And World Urban Parks, basically, we want to have everybody having parks close to their home, good quality urban parks. And I, we have cities that are members, national organizations, also individuals, and people become members and they can join any of these committees on children play and nature, who can be healthy parks, healthy people, all their adults and parks. And if you want any more information, go there more parks. But everywhere I go, people say, Kim, what's 886? Well, 886 is not about parks or streets or sidewalks. It's not about walking or cycling or sports. Those are the means, not the end. The end is how can we have successful cities? The other day I was in Warsaw, Jacob talking about physical activity. Uh, I learned so much from Miska. It's good that you become members of Miska, active members. Look in Warsaw, this is where I was going to speak the day after. And I went to see the place and I said, oh, how am I going to compete with all of these people dancing? What a great way to use the public space. And then I saw the DJ, DJ Vika. <laughs> She's an entrepreneur. She organizes these dances all over Poland, goes from city to city to city, organizes these dances. And she's the, her own DJ, and she's at, at the equipment. But that's what ANN is about, is helping have vibrant cities and healthy communities. Where everybody 
you're gonna live happier. And when people, when I'm in any city, always, people are asking me, Gail, is this intersection safe? Can I send my children walking to school? Can my grandparents ride their bike to the park? I said, look, you don't have to be an engineer. Three simple steps. We call it the eighty rule of common sense. Unfortunately, common sense seems to be the least common of the senses. Step number one, think of a child that you love, your son, your daughter, your grandchild. Once you have that child in mind, step number two, think of an 80 year old that you also love, your parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters. Jimmy Carter that was in building homes in Canada last month at 93. And when you have the child and the older adult, then step number three. <coughs> Would you send them across that intersection? Would you send them walking to school or to public transit or cycling to get eggs or milk? Would they feel safe? If you would, it's because he's safe enough. If you would not, it's because he's not. And we gotta do it better. What if everything we did is permanent? And in any city, the sidewalk, the crosswalk, the park, the school, the library, the hotels, the buildings, everything had to be great for an eight and an eighty. It's not a two eighty, it's a and eighty as an indicator species. Because if it's good for the eight and it's good for the eighty, it's gonna be good for everybody. From zero to over a hundred, we gotta stop building the cities as if everybody was thirty years old and athletic. And we gotta build great cities for all. That is the concept of eight eighty. It's simple, but it's powerful. Does anybody have any questions? So is it clear what the eight eighty is, or any comments on that? Yes. How can we kind of in a group of eight How? How can you be part of these eight eighty groups? Well, it's really simple. Well, one thing we can provide help. Go to our website, everything is free. We are not for profit, 880cities.org, I'll have it at the end. And we have videos and documents and things. But more than anything, anything that you see in the city, when people say, oh, come here, I'm gonna show you this. When I was working yesterday in, in, in Ghent, uh, in Belgium, they have really increased cycling. But many of the bikeways, I said, you know, think of an 80 year, 80 year old, you have a kid, oh yeah, I have a one that is seven. I say, would you send them in? Oh no, not here, because I, we only painted a line. Okay, if it's, not, if it's not safe for an eight-year-old, it's not safe, period. Don't even call it a bike. On everything that we do. Yes? It's um, uh, a reflection, I suppose. A lot of the political uh, position at the moment, certainly in the UK, I think, is that the be-all and end-all is growth. And probably behind that growth is economic growth. You know, that sort of thing. So, how... I'm sure that can happen in the vision you've shown. You know, personally, I think it's a fantastic vision. But how do you, you know, and say you're, you know, you're growing things, manage to convince that the way to, you know, a good life is that sort of stuff, as opposed to, you know, um, growth for business sake? I don't hold that for a minute. That's the most important, one of the most important questions. You're totally right. How are we going to make that happen? How do we convince the leaders of Birmingham that that's what we should be doing? and the leaders of Mumbai and of Sao Paulo and everywhere. I'll tell you in a minute how. You know, I anticipate is today we live in an ever more globalized world. And in a globalized world, the best people, they can live anywhere they want. However you define best. It can be the best engineers, it can be the best coffee makers, community organizers. If I'm a really good carpenter, I can live anywhere I want. So where am I going to live? Whatever me and my family have the best quality of life. So it is very, very important that when we are doing our cities, a city that is great for aid and for aid is going to be good for everybody. That's where people are going to go. Two centuries ago, what made cities powerful was taking one land, so they would take over the next door neighbor. In the last century, it was capital, so they were subsidizing income. Now Amazon. Amazon is looking for a place to set up their headquarters. They are not asking cities who's going to give me more subsidies. They are saying cities compete who wants to have Amazon with 50,000 employment. They are asking which one has universities, high percentage of universities, which ones are walkable, bikeable, have good public transit, have parks with the walking distance of everybody. They are asking for that. That is how today 
we attract good. Why do they want that? Because they want to be able to attract <coughs> 50,000 good people working for them. From the person that is cleaning the building to the engineer that is going to come up with the ideas. <coughs> so we got to tell you, this, creating a good city for people, today is the most important thing to have a city with economic development. I want everybody in this room to become a guardian angel. A guardian angel of the gentle majority. What I mean by gentle majority is the children, the older adults, the poor. And by gentle I mean is they're not a squeaky wheel. You do a public meeting, the children are not there because they are sleeping. The poor people are not there because they are doing two or three jobs. So when anything you decide in cities always, be the guardian angel, think how would this affect? The children, the other. When we evaluate any city anywhere, we should evaluate cities is how well we treat the most vulnerable people. The children, the older adults, and the poor. Let me give you an example of each one. The children. Let's have cities that are playable. Playable. Everywhere. You are walking on the sidewalk and you find a swing. You are waiting for the bus and there is a small park lane. This is not expensive, this is not about money, it's more about creativity. Have a crosswalk, make it really, really visible. You know, it's exciting, this is a much more fun scene to live in. And sometimes people say, oh Gil, this is nice, but it's uh, fun and games. No, it's fun and games, but it's much more than that. That's how children learn. That's how children develop their muscle strengths, their cognitive thinking, their capacity to socialize, to have friends. Playing is very, very important. It should be a top priority. We should have parks everywhere. Let's start building parks within walking distance of everybody. Yesterday in game, I saw this, that is a really cool idea. On this one, for example, three months ago, this was cars, car parking. They got rid of the cars. But they are not waiting to have to do the whole park perfect, because then citizens say, oh, this looks ugly, why don't you let park? No. People went home on a Friday, they came back on Monday, and they have put all of these plants. Everything is just like a pilot. Put it in and have take over, put chairs and tables, and they are putting these things that are parklets on wheels. Really, really nice, these parklets on wheels, because this takes up the space of one car space. But since they are on wheels, every month they can rotate, and then in each neighborhood there's going to be a different one. And you promote the physical activity, and you also promote in this one theaters and other things. In front of City Hall, they did this gigantic structure. People said, oh, what's going to happen there? Whatever people want. They want people to come and play. They just did the roof, a gigantic roof in front of City Hall. So sometimes they have swings. Other times, kids just come out. You have music, you got aerobics, you got dances. But in Birmingham, and in every city, we should have a goal. What if we have a goal that everyone is going to have a park within walking distance? A play area in the next four years, not in the next 40, in the next four years. It's totally doable. That's why I said let's start building parks everywhere. Because we're going to do that in the next four years. Every kid in the world should have a park or a play area. Imagine this beautiful thing. This is one of the parks that I like the most in Toronto. It has next to it, it has a park with all the plastic, but this is where the kids like to go. Four to one. For every one kid that goes to the plastic, four go. all you need is water and fun. And people might say, but what if we don't have an area for a park or a city is built down? Let's take what belongs to us. The streets or the sidewalks, the schools, the libraries. Look, New York, they thought that they had park within walking distance of everybody. They did this analysis. That's one of the ways to do it. They did an analysis. Who ha what, do all kids have a park within 500 meters? And they found that many did not. So they said, what can we do? Then they realized the schools. They went to the schools and they said, schools, this is what you call a playground. This is horrible. <laughs> they said, we'll make a real playground if and only if you make it a school park. And trees. Why is it so important the green spaces? Because the children reduce the attention deficit and have hyperactivity disorder. But it wasn't one or two. They did this all over the city, turning this into this. Look, if it has a, an area, a garden, a lot of gardens, this can even take up to 55,000 gallons of water if they get a, one of the 100 year storms. They increase by more than 30%. More than 200 playgrounds without buying one centimeter of land. 
Ya stay. And what happens if you don't have a school? The only condition is that the school after 4 p.m., Saturday, Sundays, and on vacation, they gotta open it to the community. And if you don't have a school, take over a street. Close it on one end, let only the people that live on the street, and make it a play street. What more are we gonna play in this? Older adults who are living longer, not longer, much, much, much longer, and it's so exciting, you know? The people that have 60, that in the history of humanity, the people that have reached 65, Half are alive today. Half. This is something that is totally new. It's so exciting, and the plus 65 are going to double, and the plus 80 are going to quadruple. And people are not thinking of retirement. People are thinking more is of retirement. We should create a movement of the 60 plus alive. I think the biggest waste of resource, the biggest waste of resource in the world is the older arts. People retire, and we cross them out as if they had died. Except that they got 20, 30, 40 years left. And they are healthier and wealthier and more active, with more experience, with more knowledge. Imagine if in the movement of ISCA, getting everybody to move, if all of a sudden we got the older adults as a movement, if they own this, they would help us. In the US, there is an ARP, the Association of Retired People, has 38 million members. Imagine if they send to 38 million homes every month a magazine. Imagine that every month people are getting move, 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 and showing ways. Imagine if, are, if they become a pressure to make the intersection safe, and to make the streets, and to build the cities, and to maintain the parks. The older adults could be tutoring kids at school. They could be teaching English or whatever language to the refugees, to the immigrants. They could be organizing walks, walking groups in the parks and being active. Also, our universities, 20-30% of the courses should be for older adults. Older adults are hungry. They want to learn about music and history and science and about activity. You know, if we had been born in the UK 150 years ago, our life expectancy would have been 39. So many of us would be dead by now. Now it's more than double. And when you double the life expectancy, it's clear that we have learned how to survive. But when we have all of these issues of climate change and public health and traffic congestion, it's clear that now we need to learn how to live and moving. The human right to move is about learning how to live. So we gotta think, what role are we gonna play in this? Because a lot of this has to do is with the built environment. And remember that we're gonna improve the cities that we have today, but we're gonna create cities in our lifetime, or in the lifetime of our children, for 3.7 billion. Imagine having older adults and children doing gardens, the bonding multi-generational, and the third element was the poor. I'm talking about equity, I'm not talking about equality. Some people are starting so far behind that they don't need one box everybody. I thought this cartoon was really good. It's about equity. So I need two or three boxes, so that I don't need a box. Imagine from the point of view of mobility. From the point of view of mobility, the people that have used a car are spending 20, here in the UK, are spending 25% of their income on mobility. One out of four pounds. And if they are low income, it's about 40%. It's huge. No wonder people that have cars are totally asphyxiated. You know, the last example from Belgium. Yesterday they were telling me in Belgium that they have car, uh, company cars. And they give, as part of the salary, a company car. What? How ridiculous. I said, you know, that's not fair. What if instead of giving cars, they would say, okay, the cost of a car, a small car, is about $8,000 a year. So people, you can choose. We give you a company car or we give you a check for $8,000. Every year, 8,000 this year, 8 next, 8 next. And if it's a medium sized car, it might be 10,000 and a big car, 12,000. I mean, you buy a car for $30,000, they sell it three years later for 10,000. So it costs them 20,000. Only depreciation, just 7,000 just depreciation, plus gas and insurance and so on. I wonder if people would say, oh no, give me my 8,000, I'd rather do something else. And this is great for the local economy because then they're going to use that to do, improve their garden, and be physically active, and to go to restaurants. If people who use public transit and walk them back, they will spend only 5%. So there is nothing that the governments can do that would improve the economic situation of the families more 
than allowing people to downsize from two cars to one. And it's great for the economy, or from one to zero. And it's great for the economy, for the community, because people are going to spend that. And by the way, when I'm talking about equity, sometimes we are to think only of, of the low-income countries, or developing. No, it's, we, we're, not, we're not doing very well in many places. I was working two months ago in Israel, and I saw the, the sheer, these are the wealthiest countries in the world, the OECD. And the people living in poverty, one out of four in Israel, one out of five in the US, one out of ten in the UK. It doesn't have to be that way. South Korea, one out of 14. And our Danish friends, one out of 37. You know, it cannot be that some of the wealthiest countries and one out of four children live in poverty. Earlier this year, I was working in Malmo, in Sweden, and the mayor, the deputy mayor was telling me, he said, I live in this neighborhood, and we have, our life expectancy is seven years more than the people that live two neighborhoods down the road. Last year, I was working in Cleveland, and I went to this part of the city. The life expectancy is 64, and then I went 10 minutes away, it's 90, 90. This is how we be built in the, and it's not because it's clean and you go to Washington and it's the same, you go to New Orleans and it's the same. But I don't know what is worse, that this is happening or that people are saying, oh, you know, that's normal. Yeah, the people here are going to live, the life of 55, it's because they're lazy. It's because they drink too much beer. What? You go to these places, there is not even one grocery store where you can buy healthy food. There are four times as many convenience stores than in this area. The sidewalks are totally run down. There are no parts, and if there are parts, they are totally destroyed. So we must do better. So from the point of view of children, all their adults and poor. Any comments or any questions from anybody? Yes. I'm living close to two parks. Two parks in Birmingham. One is a Hansors Park and one is uh, in near Aston Villa Stadium. And from my observation, I, I can see that Hansors Parks have been attract more people. And you know why? <laughs> because I think there is a lake and there are a lot of birds and birds are always moving and then I don't know how does it work but I think it attracts people to come and walk so even I choose to, to come to that park so I think uh, animals uh, being in parks can help people to be encouraged in activity it's very clear, the people that live close to a park, many, many studies, all of them are consistent, are more physically active than those who do not. Yes? Yeah, I was just going to say this is um, my sweet best park I've ever heard. Um, but there's a hell of a lot of information in here, and it's the sort of thing you go away and you think, that was a great talk. So I think from this, you know, a couple of simple messages. One is that children can access play areas, green space, <coughs> simply. And the second point you made is quite right, is people like me, now at the age of 61, desperate to do stuff. And I've got plenty of life, but lots of people are essentially bored and unfulfilled. So I think linking that young and old, I think that's a critical point. And that's an easy message for people to get. And that we should do. The two main concerns of older adults, almost universal, is mobility and isolation. Mobility and People want to age in place. They want to continue shopping in the same stores. And isolation. They might live in a city of five million people, but they feel isolated. So we need not only to do the part, but also to do, have the activity to help them out. Very successful now in the parks to go knitting. People could go knitting in their house. They go knitting as a group because they want to be with other people. Walking groups. Again, they could walk by themselves. They walk in group because they want to be with people. Uh, I have one question. Uh, do you have some examples of, let's say, failures where you try to do something and you failed? And the question is, is it even possible to do any of this without cooperation of city officials and cities' improvement? 
Yes. At the end of the day, you need the gold. I saw a wonderful interview that Bill Gates and Melinda Gates did to Barack Obama last month. It's on YouTube, I recommend it's really good. Obama spoke for 30 minutes and then there was an interview. And at some point, Obama turned to them and said, he was asking the young people that were there that they need to get engaged in government, to participate. And then he said, look, Melinda and Bill, to them, <laughs> uh, he said, you are putting over $30 billion of their money, 99% of their wealth they are putting it in the foundation. And then that's a lot of money. He said, but that's only a small fraction of the U.S. government. He said, the U.S. government has a lot more money. We need people to get into governments and do things. In other words, the message is, yes, we can do, we can and should do a lot of things at the neighborhood level, at the school, in our business, in our company, with our friends, in the faith groups. Also. But also, we need to make sure that the governments also do their part. That's a good point. Let me tell you a little bit about sustainable mobility because it's in link with the previous question as well. Uh, who regularly walks? Who okay, came walking today? And everybody from the hotel. <laughs> but you know, people say, oh, I don't walk. Well, everybody walks. When I go to cities, you, they, especially even in developing countries, they say, oh, you are, don't tell us about walking. You want us to stay poor all our lives? You know, walking and cycling, walking and cycling is not a joke. Walking and cycling is not a frivolity. Walking and cycling is the only individual mode of mobility for most people around the world, including in Birmingham. It's the only individual mode of mobility for all children and youth. You might be the son or the daughter of Bill Gates. And if you're under 16, your only individual mode of mobility is to walk and bike. That's why walking and cycling should be like a human right. Unless we think that only the people that have the money and the age and the desire to have a car have a right to individual mobility. That's why we're also talking about democracy, human rights, and equality and sustainability, because everything is linked to everything. Walking, there is nothing as important as walking. I really think the only way that we can get people around the world to be physically active five days a week or more, is walking. I have not seen in any country any other way. People, I think that we should run and play soccer and basketball and dance and do aerobics and all of this. But people do that twice a week, three times a week. But not seven days a week. Instead, if we put walking as a normal part of everyday life, or taking public transit, public transit, it's not going to pick you up in front of your house. So you walk 10 minutes to public transit, then get to work, you walk another 10 minutes to your work, you do the same in the afternoon and you already did 40 minutes. You can do 40 minutes, 30 minutes a day, adults, 60 minutes a day, the children. Then you can go and do all the sport that you want out of enjoyment. You already did your 30 minutes. So walking is critical. You know, just the birds fly and the fish swim, people, we walk. The children, the youth, whether you're in South Korea or the kids in Atlanta or in South Africa, the youth going to school, the adults, the older adults, we walk in the summer, we walk in the winter, we walk in, but we gotta make it safe, we gotta make it safe. Yesterday, yesterday, people driving cars killed 741 people walking. And today, another 741. That's more than one person every two minutes. Every two minutes. And we play, we, we see on the media and he said, car stroke a person. No, the car don't strike anybody. It's people driving cars. He doesn't say knife got into someone's belly. No, it was a man stabbed someone with a knife. Even a bicycle. Bicycle runs over a pedestrian. They don't say bicycle hit <coughs> a pedestrian. No. A person on his bike or a cyclist. There are not accidents. Accidents is when nothing could have been done about it. There are incidents and we gotta stop it. Sweden came up with an idea, really great, of vision zero. They said people are not perfect, so there are we make mistakes. So how can we improve that? And cities now all over the world because the rates were really they said nobody should be dying in traffic, walking or cycling, or in cars. 
In cars also no one should be dying in cars or in public transit. And if we're going to improve walking, the pedestrian got to be the priority. We cannot be on sidewalks like this. We cannot allow the cars to go on the sidewalks almost all over the world. Even more in developing countries. People that have a car, they think, oh, I'm rich, I'm powerful, I can put my car here. But also, you go to places like Milano, Italy, that used to be a fantastic, beautiful city, and now they are suffocated by cars on the sidewalks everywhere. These people, who are telling these people every day, you are a second-class citizen where we don't even build sidewalks. And if we're going to improve walkability, it's really, really simple. Only first, we're going to do sidewalks. We need to lower the speed everywhere. Not 30K zones, no, that was 20 years ago. 30K everywhere. All the residential areas have to be 30K. Not the arterial. The arterials can be 40, 50, 60. As soon as you turn into a neighbor, 30. Why 30? One is because if you get hit by a car at 30, there is only 5% probability of being killed. If you get hit at 50, it goes to over 80%. And there are many, many studies that show exactly the same thing everywhere. But there is also something that people walk a lot more. That's also something that is nice. Even if people don't get hit by cars, people, a lot more people walk. Because when you are walking and the cars are going at 25 or 30, it's an enjoyable walk. When the cars are going at 50, 60, it's not enjoyable. Also, people walk differently. When people are walking and the cars are slow, they relax, they go window shopping. Someone is walking their dog and they talk to them. They see their neighbor and they chat. So even that. These are not technical issues. These are not financial. For example, if we have a small island on a crosswalk, we eliminate more than half of the incidents. Why are we still doing crosswalk without an island? When we know that we're in an island, we're going to eliminate more than half of the incidents. Kids go on a field trip. Not everybody crosses a one line. Then they can have a place to be. Older adults, they are the ones that are killed the most in the intersections, three times as much, as, three times as many as the proportion, proportion of the population. So we should be building cities a lot better. When I'm talking about sustainable mobility, not only walking, it's also bicycles, using public transit, new uses of cars. I'm not saying that this is the end of the car industry, but the way we use cars is changing very, very fast. In the US, in the last four years, the young people, 16 to 24, purchased fewer cars than in the last 40. Got fewer driver for the young people, fortunately, the car is not a status symbol anymore. It's more of a status symbol than I got. <coughs> more of a status symbol to get a backpack and go out visit other countries, to pay a higher rent and live in a walkable neighborhood. And also the cars were using them differently. All their adults are terrified to lose their driver license for age. They're impacted so much as if they have been diagnosed with cancer. It's not because of love of cars, it's because of love of mobility. And now people say, oh, everything is going to solve with driverless cars. Well, if we don't change our behavior, this is what cities look like with drivers, without driverless cars. And this is how they're going to look like with driverless cars. <laughs> Nothing is going to change. Actually, we might even have more cars. We need to increase the people riding bicycles, and there are many, many ways to improve. And it's not about many cities they just paint. This is the city that I live in, that is really lousy for cycling, that is Toronto. They put up signs, and they do bicycle parking, and they do bicycle lockers, and maps, and all of these things, that they don't improve cycling. They even get bike share, people are going crazy about bike share all over the world. That's getting like the saddle before the horse. The only two things that increase cycling, the only two things, I mean, all of that, think for a minute if you or someone that you know, your spouse, your parents, your children, are not cycling on the streets of Rio de Janeiro, of New York, of Birmingham, Think, would that person, you or that person that you love, would that person start biking if you do maps, or you put signs, or you do bicycle parking? Probably not. The only two things that really increase is one, to lower the speed in the neighborhoods. Because when the cars are going at less than 30, then you can share. And two, to build a minimum grid. A grid. What is the network? The minimum network is a triple A bike. What is triple A? All ages and abilities. It has to be for novice. It's not just for the Hispanics, 30-year-old athletic, no, it's for everybody. We gotta think of daytime and nighttime. We gotta think of the summer, of the winter, of the, the people opening doors. And there are many, many ways. This is Montreal, this is Paris. 
And it, sometimes people just paint the line. I said, don't, don't just paint the line. Enhance the painted line. Put those plastic for ours. And it's going to make a world of difference. Why do we want back in Copenhagen? Because you got this magnificent grid that you can go from anywhere to anywhere safely. Just that we have a power grid or a water grid, we have to I'm sure have a bicycle grid. And also we need to improve public transit. My brother that is mayor of Bogota says that the civilized city is not the one where the poor have cars. It's the one where the rich use public transit. We gotta have public transit that can be used by everybody. And when I was working with the mayor of Malmo, he said, oh, yeah, you know, people have this issue with the buses. They don't like buses. So what did he do with his buses? He put a nose, he covered the wheels, and now they look like trains. <laughs> Part of it has to be about marketing. The other day, a mayor said, Gil, now everybody's going to get out of their car because we bought these big buses. I said, you think anybody's going to get out of their car when this is what the bus stop looks like? And this is a school for 1,500 people, and this is the bus stop for 1,500 students. So I decided to show that mayor another bus stop. <laughs> he said, Gil, why are you showing me this bus stop? I said, because maybe this is how the bus stop would look like if the decision makers use the bus service. <laughs> <laughs> any questions on, any, any questions on, 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 on sustainable mobility, walking, cycling, public transit, new uses of cars, or comments? Anybody? Two or three, yes. Here's the mic. Gail, you mentioned that at the end of the day you have to speak to the other local government or the national government to solve the issues of the problem because the resources are there. And my question is, even if you get, if you get that one person in a city that is the ambassador of, of, or has been to your presentation and he or she says, this is my mission, this is what I'm going to do, but how, do you have any good practice to share with us? How do you make sure that you have everybody on board within the city council? Like, have you ever done this process just to make sure that people from the education, from sports, from the transportation, and everybody else, that all, this, uh, all the stakeholders are involved and they know why they do what they do? Because I understand being a mayor, I can tell everybody what to do. But what happens if one of us comes, comes back home and then they try to make a difference? How do you make sure that everybody's on board, like all the decision makers are on board? It never gonna happen. Never. And I'm gonna tell you about change in a minute. Never everybody's gonna be on board. Change is hard. Change is hard. In Birmingham or in Bogota or in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen the car was taking over. In the fifties and sixties and seventies. They were way below ten percent cyclists. And now they're over forty percent. Because the people people can no longer be spectators. People need to participate. If a cyclist was killed, city hall, the main square was totally full with people demonstrating. But I'm going to talk about change in a minute. And, what, and how to get that change. Any comment on this mobility? Yeah, just uh, a bit on, on grid. Um, obviously, you've got to start somewhere, but is there a formula for the, the amount of cycleway you need per 10,000 population for it to really create the modern shift? The grid? Yeah. Well, you need that network. You might start with a small network in the downtown and start growing it out or start something. But if you don't connect origins and destinations, it's not going to work. Sometimes people say, oh, let's do a byway and see if people use it. And then you see the numbers and they say, oh, you know, we went from 100 to 200, which is double. But you said we're going to go to 1,000. Well, if you don't connect anything with it, it's like if you do a football field. You do a football field and you say, mm, I don't know, let's do a little, let's do one, one goal this year. The next year you have a little bit of money and then you do the middle of the football field. The next year you are going to do the other goal and people say, oh, you know, we don't have a football culture because I haven't seen people playing games. Well, if you don't have a, a football field, you don't want to see people playing games. Same thing happens with cycling. If you just do one lane that doesn't connect anything with anything, people are not going to use it. We need to create a network. We, we can start creating a minimum network connecting the downtown and then expanding. Or if we think that we're going to have one every two kilometers, then we can say, okay, at least let's start by having one every four kilometers. But, but it has to connect origins and destinations or else it's not going to work. That's a very important. Parks. Someone was asking about parks. Let's open our mind about parks and public spaces. The role that parks can play. You know, Marmon lost half of the jobs 
in two years, the shifters went to South Korea. They had to reinvent themselves, and part of reinventing themselves was through the public places. So I want you to open up our minds about what parks and play in order to get people to move. Detroit is going and revitalizing itself. What are they doing? They are doing some of this. Where moments come from. Beautiful skateboard parks. And I, you know, what I like about this skateboard park is not only that it has a beautiful tree, but that it has a nice cozy area for parents and grandparents. That's how you get multi-generational. Every time that we do a playground, we should make sure that just as important as the swing or the, or, or, or the slide is a cozy area for parents and grandparents. A few months ago, I was working in Tel Aviv in, in, in Israel. And I, when I met with the mayor and, and a big public meeting, I told them, I said, you know, I went to one of your dog, uh, to, uh, no one, four of their dog parks. The parks for dogs, beautiful. The fence at the right height. Uh, it had uh, good lights for night. It had shade for the, the, for the owners of the dogs. It had benches, garbage, bag. Fantastic. And then I said, you know what? My perception is that here in Tel Aviv, you know so much more how to make dogs happy than people, because I, than children under five. Because I visited 20 different parks. And I did not see one that was nice for a child under five. We keep talking, talking, talking that the most important years of their life are the first five years. And I could not see one nice part for children under five. So that, that is the kind of thing we need to be consistent. If we're going to say, oh, for children, oh, just put a slide and a swing. No, maybe that might be okay for the child eight to 12. But that's not going to be for the youth, and that's not going to be certainly for the other five. We got to think of that, those post years also, so that the grandfather can bring the grandkid and bond him. But if there's not a place to see that socialize, you're going to be get bored in a few minutes. We need big parks in the middle of the cities, we need elevated like High Line, or we need along the rivers. Let's open our mind about those parts. I was watching the football club last time. I was working in Chicago. Where did I go? I went to see it in the parks. And that's what they were doing in South Korea and in Bogota and in Germany. And not just about sports, the umbrella revolution in Hong Kong. Where do people go? To the parks and public spaces. <coughs> Occupy Wall Street. You know, because the parks and the public spaces are great and equalizing. Yes, we shall be. Everybody's equal. Here, nobody cares who's rich or poor or fat or skinny. Everybody's the same. But again, it's not just politics. Here we have in Rio, two million people. It wasn't during the World Cup. It was when the Pope went there and was giving a mass for two million people. And again, it doesn't have to be big. It can be small. It can be a neighborhood. These are the kind of things where you would say, can we do it at a neighborhood? Yes, at a neighborhood. You just paint the stairs in a neighborhood and you start transforming the way people live and the way people behave. Imagine just for the point of view of citizen engagement, you get a small business or a family painting each one one step, 130 steps. They put their initials. All of a sudden, the sense of belonging. We gotta have great parks, but not only parks, a city-wide park system. So when you go back to your cities, I want you to look at some of the parks and public places. These are some symptoms that they are good because you hear a lot when you listen and you see a lot when you observe. One symptom, good places to sit. This guy needed five chairs to be happy. His feet, his Big Mac. He would not have been happy on a bench. Sometimes we see monkey see, monkey does. Sometimes it's people see, people do. We do sidewalks and we don't put benches. Last year I was working in Lexington, Kentucky with the mayor, and I went on a walk with the mayor. After 10 blocks, I had not seen one bench. <coughs> and I said, Mayor, you don't have one bench. And then he took me to the side and he said, yeah, we took off, we took out all the benches because of the homeless. I said, oh. I said, Mayor, I'm not gonna go into the discussion of the homeless, but you know who you're hurting even more than the homeless? The older adults. Older adults will not walk if there are no benches every other block. So just in case they get tired, they want to sit. So I said, look. I said something horrible, but I said, even, don't say that it is for the homeless. Have your bench and put a, two dividers in the middle. 
And when people say, oh, you're doing that so homeless won't sleep, they say, no, you saw that all their arrows can sit easier and get up easier. But you cannot take the benches. Can you imagine the kind of solutions? I was on a bicycle tour in Utrecht, my beautiful Utrecht, Netherlands, with the deputy mayor. And we went to a brand new park. And she said, what, how do you like it? It's beautiful, new. It was 5.30 in the afternoon. Empty. And I said, yeah, it looks nice, but I don't see any people. You know, parks are for people. And she said, oh, maybe they're having dinner. I said, everybody? <laughs> and then I said, there are no benches. And she had another reason. She said, oh, it's because we were having too many issues with the young people, the youth, that they hang around a bench. So we took out of the benches. You know, that reminded me of the guy that went home and found that his wife was doing something wrong with the next door neighbor on the sofa. So he sold the sofa. <laughs> How can you take the benches out of the party with the young people? Well, good places to sit. We put nails on top of it. This guy was so tired, he sat on his briefcase. His friend actually fainted. His wife is sitting on the baby. <laughs> But when you have nice places to sit, and it's wonderful, it's gorgeous. The middle of the winter, people with more chairs, they don't even sit facing each other. They sit facing other people. It starts to rain and they won't even move. Another symptom, sociability. You see people talking to each other. It's a good symptom. Another diversity, when we see children, youth, older adults, people on wheelchairs. Another affection. We're affectionate if we feel at ease, if we feel safe. Another one, high proportion of women. Women are more selective. If it's not safe and clean, they don't go. So those are symptoms, but what makes a park a good park? One, management. I think the biggest problem of parks is that they are undermanaged. Undermanaged. They don't do, for example, activities of grandparents and grandchildren. So most cities think that management is synonymous of maintenance. No! Maintenance is not even 20% of management. Picking up the garbage and cutting the grass. No, management is a more is about the uses. How do have activities in the summer and in the winter, in the daytime and at night and in the winters and the, it's all the time. It's how to go to the elementary school so that they come and do activities in the park and with the seniors and the different ethnicities and the different faith groups. We gotta get all of a sudden people are walking and cycling and playing chess and reading and having naps. We gotta have volunteers, but let's give them the tools. Let's ask them before, during, after, when we're going to make any changes, citizen engagement, let's have resources, human, financial, then make them safe, but not like in London, that they put a sign, beware of the thieves. That's like an invitation to all the thieves of the city, come here because here's a good market. You need a lot of police in the parks when they're empty. You don't need when they're well used. Get people in the park and they're going to become very safe. Let's have equitable with the city. Let's have a good fit so that not all parks have the same activities. They have things for the winter. They have things for the summer. Some people want to get married in the summer. Other people want to get married in the winter. They want to use their parks. But again, it's not about having one big, gigantic, park, iconic park in the city. we got to have a system. So that's your skill. Should we invest in small or in large? Unfortunately, you can invest in both because they satisfy different needs. We need a small neighborhood park because that builds the sense of belonging. That is where we meet the neighbors. So we also develop a sense of solidarity. Something is happening on the street and we go out and help. But if we don't know anybody, we shut the door and we stay inside. But we cannot play football in the, in the neighborhood park. So we, gotta, we need medium-sized parks with football and so on. But we're not going to be able to go canoeing, so we need a big size. We need a city-wide network of small, of medium, of large. We need active, we need passive, we need contemplative. we got to create this a system. That's why I also think, well, you know, what, what, what makes a, a great park system? Obviously great parks, different sizes, good assets, enough land, good funding, shared vision of them. That's why I also think another definition of a good city like a good park. Totally integrated with nature and extremely safe, especially for children and older adults. Let me take you to some examples of because we are doing things in many places. Lots of good, but it's like acupuncture. One here, one there. How do you make that to be general? And let's open the discussion of that after. Goes for one good thing. Many goes for cars are becoming parks for people. Here in Oros, they used to have a river going through here. 
40 or 50 years ago, people said, you know, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. So they built a road on top of it. And when someone was talking about economic development, eight years ago they said, oh, can we go to Birmingham and get the best people to come and live here? Probably not. So someone said, wasn't there a river going down? And look what they did eight years ago, they brought it out. So, you know, they say, oh, European cities, they were built that way. No, Copenhagen had six lanes of cars here. They took out the four lanes in the middle and created a linear park of 1.8 kilometers. Seoul had six lanes at one lane, at one level, got full, they did a second level, then they wanted a third level, 30 kilometers. Third, look how God she 30 kilometers. And the mayor said, no city has some mobility through a private car. None. The only way is public transit. So he told down the second, the first he brought out the river, and look what he did 10 years ago. Magnificent. He created a linear part of 13 kilometers through the middle of the city. Madrid, what's in it? Now the mayor of Paris, this year, she just said that this that she's doing it only on Sunday, she's going to make it a permanent part. And last year I was working in the World Bank, I'm talking in the World Bank, and I said, it is even ethical that you're funding these kind of things in developing countries? Is it ethical that these countries are doing these elevated highways? Imagine how this is breaking up. When we know it doesn't work, in India, less than 10% of the household have cars, less than 10, and they're investing billions and billions in elevated highways. They are building them so far that they even fall down before they are open. But other cases, because I know that some of you are saying, oh, in my city, in the East Coast city, in my city, we are different. Girl, we got nothing in common with Copenhagen or New York or Bogota. We are unique, regardless of where you are coming from. I know that your city is unique. Always remember that you are something unique, just like everybody else. This is not about copying and pasting like we do on the computers. It is how to adapt and improve. Look, the other day, does anybody have heard of a singer called Shania Twain? Shania Twain? Mm -hmm. Oh, poor Shania. <laughs> She's just coming back. She came up with a new... Uh, oh, you heard of Shania. I love her. Uh, she comes from this town, 43,000 people. And the mayor said, okay, you got to come and see this park. And I said, oh, but why? She said, because three years ago you came by and you showed us the pilot project of New York. And I said, ah, she got it. Instead of saying, oh, I'm from a city of 43,000, I got nothing to do with New York. No, she kept an open mind. And that's what I'm asking you to do today also, keep an open mind. Not to copy and paste. But she said, oh, pilot. She took the concept and went back to Timmins, closed the road in front of City Hall, put on chairs and tables and businesses, and created a park a pilot park from May to October, because after October is minus zero degrees. <laughs> so, everybody is going to learn from everybody, not only what to do, but also what to avoid, because there are many problems. This woman, a friend of mine, is a physical education teacher on a small community. She saw that here fewer and fewer kids were walking to school. She asked them, why don't you walk to school? Because they were afraid of the cars. People say, oh, it's because it's cold. No, it wasn't because it was, they were afraid of the cars. So when the kids went home on vacation, they came back and Anne was dressed up as a pilot. She shut down the parking lot. And all of a sudden, at minus 24 degrees, the kids were walking. And the kids were cycling. We need to facilitate. We need to build the schools around this. We're building some gigantic schools. If we want kids to walk, we need to build small schools so the catchment area is small. With the drop-off area, we got to make it on the back of the schools so that the front where kids are walking to school is safe and enjoyable. And it's not a place where parents that are late to work are running like crazy. We need hundreds of inventors because part of it is software, but part of it is hardware. Cochrane, Ontario, 5,000 people. 5,000 people and two polar bears. When I went to work in Cochrane, the week before I had been in, in Google, so I showed them some of the photos because Google invited me to look at their driverless cars and I told them about the food and the restaurants and the kind of thing that, uh, that, that it works on. But you know, after showing them all of these things, one of the things, there were some students in the audience and the thing that really caught their attention was this, the bicycle. This is how the campus in Google, everybody moves around on bicycles. And then they said, oh, 
What a wonderful, what do we do by sharing? Imagine in a community of 5,300 people, they went to the police, they said, you got a lost and found, lost, lost and found bikes, give them to us, and we fix it, and we paint it. And they created a bike share system in Cochrane, where everybody has a bike, 85% of the people have a bike within walking distance. So when people say, only the government, no. Ideally, the stars are aligned, and then the government, and, but even if the government is not on board, do, do, do. Owns. Again, a medium sized community. They started doing a mobility program. Car, walking, transit, everything. Thinking of the winter, of the summer. People going to work, people going to school. Lots of communication with the community through internet, through public meetings. The small roads, cars from direction, walking and cycling in both directions. Whenever you have more than 5,000 cars, physically separate, one level for cars, five centimeters high for bikes, five centimeters high for pedestrians. It's how to make it safe. But the most vulnerable person is the pedestrian, so they gotta be priority. And then the cyclists, and then public transit and cars. Counting, when I took the photo, 7,803 had gone by, and midnight goes to zero. So bike, put, put enough signs. Here you click, where can I have coffee? And then you walk there, moving, physical activity. <coughs> make an incentive, nice bicycle parking. The walking place in the pedestrian streets, either you need your bike out or you walk your bike. And when you start getting close to schools, you start thinking, oh, he said, do they have 30 kilometers an hour in the school? No. Zero kilometers an hour. From 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. in front of the schools, it's only for kids. And moms and dads bringing their kids, so they put ping pong tables and games and things. It's about creating cities that are safe and enjoyable for everyone. Melbourne, last example. People say, oh, cities don't change. They do change. Melbourne 30 years ago was horrible. It would not have been in the top 300 cities in the world. Today, Melbourne is in the top five of any ranking. Even they made fun of themselves. Empty, useless city center. And now, what have you done? They put art, but not art for cars at 100 kilometers an hour, art for people at five kilometers an hour. They planted trees. Look at the impact of trees. Is this a tree without trees? When we say move, move, people, when it's 40 degrees, they will walk if there is shade. They will bike if there is shade. Also, it's good for shopping, it's good for health, it's good for the environment, it's good for everything. Public health is a critical element in all of this. The public transit, also having many of these roads only for walk, they got the cars out and walking and cycling and public transit, improving the public space, all the language that were dark and dirty, they change it with restaurants and music and flower shops. The government helped. The government said, why don't you set up a restaurant? People said, oh, or put up a flower shop. They said, oh, but it's a language. The government said, I give you the seed money. I give you the first 50,000. But do it. And then they didn't do one or two. They have done 82 languages. No one wanted to live in Melbourne. Now everybody wants to live in Melbourne. This Yarra River was full of factories throwing garbage. They got rid of all of the factories and created a magnificent linear park for people to walk, to run, to canoe to kayak. Look at all of these activities. This is what Melbourne today is one of the top five cities in quality of life. And the density that they are bringing into the downtown. So sidewalks, bikes, parks, are they important? It's not so obvious. For us it's obvious, but it's not so obvious. I go to many cities and I show the mayors these playgrounds and these sidewalks, and what do they say? You go do some fundraising. But like when I show them a bottle, they go crazy about the bottle. Maybe they think that a car is going to fall here. <laughs> and the media plays into this, the media. They have this TV station hire a woman, all she does goes measure the bottle and has a session Tuesdays and Fridays at 6 p.m. Citizens, they get organized, not to pressure for sidewalks and playgrounds, but about the bottle. And when they take care of the bottle, everybody celebrates. I say, what? Why a public space? Maybe because when we look at the cities from the air, the biggest public space are the streets. The streets are between 25 and 40 percent of our cities. So they cannot be just to move cars 24/7. So what is the smart way of using our public spaces? It's very clear that walking, that cycling, that using public transit, and it's not just Oros that they did this change. Many other cities, and we gotta decide. We were gonna double the population in cities. Are we gonna do streets for cars or streets for people? 
Are we going to allow the street to look like car storage or actually to help build community? So you have any ideas of this good practice? How to turn these good practices into permanent ones? We got 10 minutes. So we're all going to wrap it up. Because, I see, Jacob is taking a Anybody has any comments about how to take these practices? Here's a microphone. Oh, I'm almost done. The next chapter is citizen engagement. Yes. Can you give a view on the electric bicycles to to uh, be used instead of cars? Could that be a revolution? I think electric bicycles are great. I think that bad electric bicycles, electrically assisted bicycles where you need to pedal, and then the electric helps you. And when it goes to 20 kilometers an hour, it disengages. So if you want to go faster than 20, then you got to do it on your own force. Uh, because though some people are putting some scooters, and they say, oh, this is a bicycle, an electric bicycle. No, that's not an electric bicycle. You don't need to pedal. If you don't need to pedal, they're horrible, because they go too fast. And they make people of bicycle uh, very afraid and, and people on bicycle don't want to ride because it's not safe. However, it's good for older adults. I have a good friend in Copenhagen. I, I was with his wife the other day and she said that she bought one electric assisted bike. And I said, oh, nice, why? And then she said, because I biked all my life. But now I got a hip replacement. And then I wasn't able to go very far. So I got this electric. So if it's electric assisted, I think it's good. But not to confuse the scooters, the electric scooters. Also, people can go from further away. Also, people that live in hilly cities, then they can say, oh, when I'm going to work, it's down here, but on the way back, is OK. So for those, so, so I, I think it's, it's good. I think that the bicycles are, have to get better and better and better. There has not been any major transformation in, in bicycles for daily use in the last 150 years. So I think that making improving materials, I think it's going to be very good. OK, before people leave, I think it's important that I mention a couple of things of citizen engagement. Because the community is the expert. Let's listen to the community. Let's hear what they want. Honestly, listen. <clears throat> Not just tokenism so that when we go to city council, they say, did you go to the community? Yes, check. No, I go to many public meetings where there are more consultants and staff than citizens. If I ask my daughter, daughter, what are you going to do in this park? She'll be saying yoga. And in that other one, they say more yoga. I say, daughter, not everybody wants to do yoga in the park. So people want to have a fire pit. This is really popular with young people. Other people, the pizza ovens in the parks, fantastic. Some people might want to paint or to exercise or walk. Let's engage people, but we ask people. Many times we ask children. We do workshops, 30 children. We live in a classroom, five per table, one adult. Each one, we give them a digital camera. Then we go to the park there like sponges learning about it. They take photos of the things they like, the things they don't like. Then they come back, they download, and at the end of eight hours, they have a vision of the park. It's because they good, because the children are the future. No, 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 it's not about that. The mayor of Curitiba, former mayor of Curitiba, says that if we educate children very, very well, they go home and they educate their parents. So it's about that. Ask the children, get them engaged, even simple things. What do you do at growing? What does your city look like? 20 years from now, when you have your parents' age, so take them away of their world. Say, now you have your parents' age and you have your children. How do you want the city? Look at all of those physical activity, moving, chairs, trees. This one road, I want few cars, I want many people walking, many people cycling. And then he didn't ride, but he drew an area for pedestrian, cyclists, buses, and cars. He knows that if we meet pedestrian and cycling, the pedestrian is going to get injured. And if we make cyclists and cars, the cyclists are going to get it. And then he drew public cars with low buildings and street level activity. So ask them. There are many, many tools. Sometimes we ask for what can we do in the next 12 months, sometimes we are in the five years. And you ask me about change. Change is hard. That's why it doesn't happen. Because doing more of the same is easier. That's why people don't change. My friend young girl says that in Copenhagen where they're going to create the first pedestrian street. Because they want a street for people walking, but then we got too many cars. And the weather is horrible. It's hot in the summer, it's cold in the winter, it rains all year round. But the number one reason why people didn't want pedestrian street, they said, is because that's not part of our culture. They said, pedestrian, that's for the Italians. Because the Italians are loud and noisy, but we are Danish, and we are cold and quiet. Let me tell you, the Danish now are more Italian than the Italians. 
They love their pedestrian streets in the rain, in the summer. This is City Hall in Copenhagen. They turn 80 parking lots into people places. Even in the middle of the winter, people come out and see. So when you're going to change anywhere, three recommendations. Three recommendations. First one, change. You ask me about you know, how to get everybody on board. Change is not unanimous. Change. If you want change to be unanimous, you have to water it down so much that it's not going to be changed any longer. Even Times Square in New York, seven years, eight years later, still 26% of the people don't like that it's pedestrian down. Second, when you are in a public meeting, the general interest must prevail over the particular. So when you are saying, are we going to widen the sidewalk? And people say, oh, but my business. No, no, don't tell me about your business. Give me the same argument, but frame it on the general interest. Why would not be good for the general interest? And three, when you say no to something, you're also saying yes to something else. So when people say, oh, we don't want this park. We don't want a, a walking path. Say, OK, that's fine. But then you are saying yes to more obesity, yes to more bad quality of air, yes to more sprawl. So I was going to ask you for citizen engagement, but I want to round up in two minutes and then leave time for three comments or questions. We got to go from talking to doing. Also, in addition to that, focus on the benefits. So I wrote an article for the European Cycling Federation that said, if you want to promote cycling, don't talk about cycling. Don't talk about environment or health. So the politician, and each politician different. Maybe one politician cares about economic development. So tell them why economic development. I say, oh, and by the way, let's have budgets. Another one doesn't, doesn't care about economic development, but cares about health. So talk about mental health, physical health. And they say, oh, by the way, parks. Let me give you an example of this. Public health, is this what the future looks like? The issue of obesity is that people have heart attacks and respiratory problems and depression and anxiety. In the US, one out of three people are obese. And then you say, oh, my country is not as bad. Don't benchmark your country with the worst. Look at this. It's a, when I was in Belgium, I was there 31st, the UK. So it's. And when we talk about obesity, we have to work on two sides of the balance, calories in and calories out. So of course, we got to improve the school lunches. We got to have gardens, farmers market all over the city. We got to have gardens and so on. But also, we need to be active. We need to move. Find your move. It's going to be great for everything: strokes, cancers, osteoporosis, heart disease. And it's not about marathons. 60 minutes a day for children, 30 minutes a day for adults. Physical activity is the wonder drug. And each one of you got a small box. Take it home, promote it, talk to everybody about it. And of course, walking and cycling are these better place to park nothing, or sidewalks or streets. But let's keep in mind that this improves physical health. But there is no health without mental health. Today, depression is the one leading cause of disability. If we have contact with nature, it's going to improve our mood our cognitive attention. So in addition, so when we plant trees and we have green areas, it's not just because it looks nice. If we have green areas, it's going to lower the pressure, anxiety, the stress. So it's a win-win. Everything is truly related to everything. And it's something that is fantastic. We're going to have nature everywhere. In the home, in the neighborhood, in the street, in the, in the city, in the national parks, in totally interconnected. Now London is coming with the concept of a national park city, which is great. So we really got to work on this and have it everywhere. And the parks for the children, let's have some parks where children are going to have fun and have some excitement. And we're going to have an interwoven network throughout the city. All of this is about how do we want to live, so please don't be complacent. Benchmark is some of the best cities. So in sometimes if cities compare themselves with the worst. If you you want to compare your city with, the, with anybody that is worse in five minutes, you can find 500 cities. No, see which are better. In sustainable and equitable cities, think outside the box. These are not technical nations, these are not financial, these are political with a big P. Everybody needs to participate. Everybody. Yeah, sorry for the moment. Okay, this is 60 seconds. 60 seconds. So, everybody that we are discussing the sidewalk, or the tree, or the park, or the bench, you're going to be at the table. Because if you're not at the table, you're going to be on the menu. And when you say, what happened with the sidewalk? What happened with the park? With the park? Oh, you were on the menu. On, on the menu. So, develop a sense of urgency and a shared vision. 
So we gotta go from talking to doing. Of course, we are doing in many places, but we gotta do more and we gotta do it faster. And with the elected officials that hit him in the heart, with the decision makers, and then one the heart, then the brain. And then decision makers are gonna move heart and brain together, creating vibrant cities and healthy communities where everybody is gonna live happier. I wish you more success moving and doing as you go home to each one of the cities. Thank you very much.